So I am going to talk about coastal systems and uh, I don't think I'm going to need the microphone so I'm just going to uh, talk probably from here. And um, we are going to see if I turn this off, see if this works, which it did earlier. So I'm going to um, provide a little bit of context about coasts. So I know that um, uh, you live, if you live here, close to the coast. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a number of different systems today. Just a little bit of context about why I think coastal systems are important. I'm going to focus on a case study of how the different challenges that I'm going to pose for coasts uh, come together in the place where I spend most of my time working. And, and we're going to uh, finish up that piece with a little transition to a short video. And then I'm going to finish up with, uh, with a few remarks about, about um, what we need to know, what do we need to know, not what does we need to know, excuse me. It must have been something I changed this afternoon. And um, ways of thinking about the future. And so I'm going to try and pull in a few examples from different places. Um, I want to start with the issues about why people live at the coast. And coastal systems um, around the world have been important places and cradles of civilization for a millennia, whether they are uh, big, wide deltas uh, like uh, the Indus or the, or the Chinese deltas, or whether they are, are fjords and ports, uh, places that have provided a safe harbor, large, large fertile areas of agricultural land with good fresh water supply, whatever. Coastal systems have been important for a long time and they're crucially important for us uh, in the 21st century. They, there are some um, uh, places where we originally settled in the United States, for instance, places that we go on vacation, uh, places that are important uh, for commerce. And some statistics here, which I'm not going to read through necessarily. I'm sure you all see and are familiar with these kinds of statistics about coastal systems. These are the kinds of things that, that one reads in the newspaper. Eight of the world's top 10 largest cities are located at the coast, and that figure may well uh, be changing and probably increasing. I would uh, doubt that that number is going to go down uh, over time. 44% uh, of the world's population live within 150 kilometers of the coast. And so these systems are both important to people, but perhaps also therefore vulnerable to people. I want to just say, just to begin with here, I'm not going to talk about all kinds of coastal systems today, but there are, of course, a, a huge variety of different characteristics of coastal systems, some of which, as we just talked about, are those which make them important and valuable uh, to people. But when we talk about coasts, areas uh, where the land meets the sea, it could be anything from a coral reef to a rocky shoreline, from a sandy system to one dominated by large boulders, uh, from mangroves to salt marshes, uh, depending on what, where we are in the world and what kind of coastal physiography uh, we have. And so this one just happened to be in the, in the presentation already. And so you can see uh, uh, the coastline that you're familiar with and the coastline of southern Florida here and, and the Bahamas. Very, very different, but still uh, subject to some of the same kinds of stresses uh, that we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, this is just a little kind of example uh, to set us up, just to remind ourselves about some of the kinds of challenges that people living at the coast and near coastal systems have caused for the natural environment here. And we're looking at, uh, at the southern tip of Florida, uh, down here uh, at the, uh, the Everglades system. And what you see in the white here are the uh, municipal areas of... Um, of Miami and Miami Beach and uh, Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach and, and essentially 8 million people uh, uh, over here and a huge area of uh, agricultural land in the red there, uh, massive production of sugarcane fields and the results of this development, most of which uh, occurred in the 20th century, is a huge adjustment change in the relationship between how the fresh water flowing through uh, southern Florida uh, meets the tide uh, down here uh, at the bottom. And so one of the things about coastal systems that I, I, you know, when I'm talking to people who don't work on the coast or aren't familiar with coastal systems, I frequently point out one of the differences that you have to think about when you think about how they work is that you have tides and waves. The water goes up and down on a regular basis. Of course, I don't have to tell you about that. You see that every day here. Um, uh, and, and wave action. These are important processes of shaping coastal systems, which are not necessarily um, those that we think of as important uh, further uh, inland. So what's happened down here in, in, in coastal Florida is essentially um, 
We now have massive problems in here, as you see, I, I, as you see the, the, um, the blue on here, that river of grass, which is uh, considered so valuable ecologically, has essentially been channelized and, and canaled uh, in, the, in the cores of agriculture, water supply, and, and uh, to uh, supply water to the people and to supply water to the, agri to the agricultural areas, uh, dramatic changes in habitat, uh, loss and, and endangered species of the order of 20 at the moment and huge problems uh, with water quality. So just one example, it receives a lot of attention in the United States, it's just one example um, of how uh, people living there doing things uh, that, are, that are very important to them have caused uh, some changes. Another one on the west coast here, uh, San Francisco Bay. Um, uh, uh, the city of San Francisco would, is, is just here on the peninsula. This is the Golden Gate here. Uh, this is uh, the Sacramento River would be uh, over to the uh, right side of these figures. And what you see on these, uh, which are from the Habitat Goals Project, is just the difference in the changes that we have made in that system uh, between the mid-19th century and here in the late 20th century. And what you see very dramatically there is a, is a change in green. The green is gone. The green essentially was the tidal marsh in the system and that has been uh, drained and converted into agricultural land or airports or developed land. Um, uh, one particular area, so, excuse me, down there, just down here, uh, one area that is of, uh, I've done a little bit of, um, of work on down here in the South Bay in the red area, was converted to salt ponds. We lost that. Um, that tidal marsh, and, and this was a good environment for producing salt, which was obviously very important uh, to uh, the local populations and to, uh, and to many aspects of, of, um, of current day life. And these, uh, these uh, different colored areas, if you've ever landed in San Francisco airport, then uh, you will have seen these multicolored ponds that you fly over as you approach from the south. And now there is an effort to uh, restore about 15,000 acres of salt ponds down here and to provide some kind of flood protection for the city of, of San Jose down here. Uh, I don't know, think I can point it out, but Google headquarters, I think, is about here. This is Silicon Valley. Huge development uh, around the South Bay. Uh, the natural environment uh, uh, dramatically altered. But what kind of natural environment do we want in the South Bay? And I think this kind of typifies this, this tension between the value that the natural environment provides and the things that people uh, expect in terms of quality of life when they live near the coast and the way in which people interact with the natural environment. And so we have issues down there in South San Francisco Bay of flooding in San Jose when there's a really high tide and the wind's from the wrong direction. We have endangered fish, we have endangered birds, and we have people who really want to interact and be out there in the natural environment. And so when we look at a restoration opportunity like this, we have the opportunity to go backwards perhaps towards something more natural compared to the changes that we made in the 19th and 20th century. But what is it that we want to achieve with that? How are, how are we going to do that? And just another uh, quick example here, uh, Venice um, uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean, um, the idea of, of, of trying to find sustainable solutions for these great cultural icons we have, very coastal dependent. Obviously, we think of the, um, the historical development of Venice as a city and the history that is well recorded about its role as a maritime nation. Its access to the sea was really critical. Key defensive uh, location there with the island in the middle of the lagoon. But all the other kinds of things that we have done there in the 20th century means that this, this great jewel of, 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 of our culture in the Mediterranean is threatened now uh, uh, by flooding. And so as we think about the future of Venice in the 21st century, we have to think about sustainability, not just in terms of the natural environment, but in terms of the social and economic and, this, and, and sustainability of our culture, uh, if you like, and this culture which is so intimately tied uh, to the coast. So coasts are important. And I think they're really important, and, and I hope I've uh, convinced you a little bit of that anyway. And, and that there is some variety to the different kinds of things that we have done uh, to them over the years. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this by lecture six. You've obviously got your minds around uh, uh, climate change a little bit, but there's no doubt 
that the 21st century is going to be warmer, there's going to be a different pattern of precipitation across the land masses, and that is going to result in combination with the, uh, with the change in temperature, we're changing land cover. And so things are going to change on the continents, and that, of course, means that things are going to change uh, at the coast too. Whoops, excuse me. Um, this is a, a table from uh, the fourth... Uh, 4AR, I guess, assessment report. That's, uh, you just, I just use the acronym. I forget what the words mean uh, these days. That summarizes what's going to happen in, in general. This is from uh, chapter six of working group two from the fourth assessment report. And it, one of the important things about this is when people think about coasts and climate change, the issue that usually rises to the top immediately is sea level rise. And I think one of the things I want to convey today is that issues about climate and the coast are more than just about sea level rise. Sea level rise is in here. Just a little key here, if you haven't seen these tables before, uh, the arrow mean, uh, shows the direction of change, and so uh, CO2 concentration would go up. Um, SST, sea surface temperature, would go up. If there's a little R adjacent to it, that means that there's a regional variation uh, uh, within the trend. And so sea surface temperature would increase, but the change in, in sea surface temperature would be regionally variable. And so we think about sea surface temperature um, and, uh, and acidification associated with CO2 concentration as being uh, issues that are really going to be very important for coral reef systems. Sea level is going to affect a number of different systems and then issues about storm intensity. Still a lot of question marks about, about some aspects of storm dynamics uh, into the future. But this is one uh, down here that I really want to point to and perhaps this will be uh, a key part of this is the idea that what happens at the coast is not just dependent upon these kinds of particular coastal drivers associated with, with um, with climate, but also what happens uh, on the continental land masses too. And so uh, we'll be looking at that uh, in, a, in a little bit more detail. So just to round this out, this, um, this idea of how the natural environment of the coast and the great variety of different uh, coastal uh, ecologies and geomorphologies that we have, these uh, uh, great uh, beautiful landscapes that, you know, I just love to go to coasts all over the place. Um, those coastal systems also give us, as society, uh, huge, uh, hugely important uh, coastal uses, be they recreational or, or economic. And what comes in with that in, in the kind of current uh, uh, terminology of the day are what we call uh, goods and services, ecosystem goods and services provided to society uh, by the coastal systems. But importantly, what comes with that too is the idea that the very uses, the things that we do at the coast to take advantage of what they provide for us, provide stress and impacts back to the coastal system. And so we either have to superimpose climate change on top of that existing dynamic between people and the coastal systems uh, within which uh, they live and work and recreate. And just another kind of example of this, and I, I'm sorry the citation is not on here, I believe I... I took this from uh, Lance Gunderson uh, at, at Emory U University, a way of looking at this as a, as a social ecological system, that we can't consider uh, what goes on in the natural environment uh, independent from what goes on in the social environment. And so we have the human system over here, and we have the ecosystem over here, and there are actions and interventions as we take advantage of that. And then we expect, of course, the ecosystem to provide us uh, ecosystem services uh, in, re in, in, in return, but these uh, actions and interventions can, of course, alter the way in which the ecosystem service uh, is provided. And we'll come back to this diagram uh, uh, just a little bit at the end because we're going to explore some of those things in the middle uh, in a little bit more detail. Superimposed on that, general interaction is the dynamic of the coast. I've already uh, 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 mentioned that one of the key points about coastal systems is uh, they're dynamic, they change very rapidly. It's one of the things that initially drew me to working on coasts. The tide goes in and out twice a day. Things are always moving, waves are always breaking. There's a lot going in, storms are coming through. There are the long-term trends of things like uh, 
like sea level rise, but there is also a very, very important uh, short-term dynamic, uh, seasonal dynamics, daily dynamics, fortnightly dynamics, lots and lots of change going on. And, and teasing out these signals, teasing out what is the, the natural dynamic of the natural system change versus the stresses that are imposed by these other things that are going on. You know, this is really um, uh, intriguing and something I think that uh, uh, there's enough there to do to keep us going for a long time. So I'm, I am going to talk um, most of the time today about, about coastal Louisiana, the Gulf Coast of the, of the United States, which is really in a pretty miserable state, I guess was typified by the, uh, the situation in, in 2005 with uh, Hurricane Katrina and uh, the dramatic uh, changes that went on there. And, and these are just a few examples, I think, of, of, of from the Gulf Coast, of the kinds of things that go on there, the imp impact that both the natural environment and the way that we interact with them. We have uh, subsidence down there, which of course means increased flooding for things like roads. This is about four or five miles uh, from where I live. This isn't a hurricane. This is a, 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 you know, a bright summer sunny day with a little bit of wind out of the southeast. As the land sinks, flooding uh, increases, um, all kinds of things, floods, not just roads. And of course, then we have important infrastructure like this, which supports those of us that live there. And I, you know, I always were taught in class that water and electricity don't mix, but apparently uh, down there on the Gulf Coast, uh, they do. Another thing on, this is just a little example of, of how we have altered coastal systems indirectly. Many of you are, are familiar with this, um, which characterizes uh, uh, river channel fragmentation, uh, published some time ago now, uh, and, and really notes that for most of the rivers uh, in the US, they have been uh, impacted by uh, fragmentation. There's some kind of dam or structure on the flow. There's no natural flow to the coast anymore. What the coast sees from upstream has been dramatically modified. As I talk about the Gulf Coast, I always like to point out this little piece here. It, excuse me, in green, which is actually the Pascagoula River, which is a very short uh, drainage, uh, 880 square miles that drains down uh, into coastal Mississippi, which is almost the only drainage in uh, the lower 48, which has not been altered in one way or another. So we do have our little gems here. We see a, this is actually the state of Mississippi, and so it's a, a really rather small cutout, but um, uh, put that in the context of the rest of the coast. This is another example from the Gulf Coast of the kinds of things that have been uh, dramatically altered. I'm going to talk about some big things that have been done. Um, but it's not always big things like 8 million people in, in Florida that cause a difference. It can be the individual actions of individual uh, homeowners. This is uh, Mobile Bay uh, in, in, in Alabama, Gulf of Mexico down here. Uh, the city of Mobile is over here and the uh, uh, Mobile River, I guess, uh, flows into the northern end uh, up here. And the black uh, shading here around the shoreline of Mobile Bay just shows, uh, this is uh, data from Scott Douglas, that just shows from 1955 uh, to the late 1990s how by 1997, 30% of the natural shoreline had been armored with bulkheads. The, the natural shoreline was being lost in a major way in terms of the interaction between uh, the bay and the natural shoreline, which great fisheries habitat, a uh, little bit of marsh there, were being lost because individual homeowners who lived on the bay didn't want their land eroding and were putting in bulkheads. And so this is 30 meters at a time, 30 meters, 30 meters, 30 meters, individual landowners doing small actions cumulatively causing dramatic change in the nature of the shoreline of, uh, of this bay feature uh, on the Gulf Coast. So um, before I get to coastal Louisiana, I just want to kind of, you know, uh, which is more, more about um, more, you know, my more specific example of, of, of the Gulf Coast. I, I do work on coastal marshes. That's what I do most of the time. And, and so I just want to say a few things about how climate change, or just to, to illustrate this point about the complexity of, of the different climate factors that we have to consider. We looked at the list earlier from, from the fourth assessment report. If we take that and look specifically at coastal marshes, sea level rise is usually considered a threat to coastal marshes. They could just go under, they could drown, they could, they could just uh, lay back and die, if you like. That, is, of course, is not how coastal marshes work. Um, there is some uh, evidence from many systems that actually a rise in sea level can provide a stimulus 
to the growth of coastal marshes. And so it all depends how much uh, sea level rise you have. There's, these are not easy answers. It all depends is really the answer. But so sea level rise is one of them. It's not necessarily a, a death threat. Storms. Uh, in the background of this, uh, of this slide here, I guess I've got a, a marsh that after Hurricane Katrina was torn up into these marsh balls. What happens when storms come through? Do they tear the marsh up like we see in the background here? Or do they actually bring sediment in? And that's been the case in coastal Louisiana over time. So there can be this trade-off between the storm could be bad or it could actually be good. It's not necessarily a straight or forward answer. Floods, similarly coming down from upstream, certainly can bring pulses of nutrients and sediments and fresh water that can actually provide an important stimulus to coastal marshes. Droughts, another potential um, um, uh, aspect of, of climate change in terms of the change in precipitation on the continental landmass can cause salinity penetration, could increase uh, aerobic decomposition if water levels are low. Complex set of interactions here. It's not necessarily uh, that straightforward. Just for coastal marshes, we could do a similar kind of thing if we looked at coral reefs. We could do a similar kind of thing if we looked at sandy beaches. So. We understand quite a lot as scientists about how those natural processes and how climate changes will inter interact with those natural processes. Importantly, we have to, as we try to understand those, superimpose on top of that the human stress that comes from the things that we do there. And so these are just a few examples. Dams upstream, which we've already talked about. Um, subsidence due to groundwater withdrawal, things like that exacerbate sea level rise. And shoreline modification of the kind, of, kind that perhaps we saw there uh, in Mobile Bay. Okay, so context, uh, coastal systems are important. And we've done a lot of things to change it and a little bit of an introduction there to some of the things that are going on on the Gulf Coast. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time now. Um, I'm going to move quite fast uh, through this, hopefully. Uh, and I've got a short video that we will pause and watch. It's only about six minutes, but I think we'll tie these pieces together uh, for you. Um, I'm going to talk about the Mississippi Delta, about the mouth of the Mississippi Delta, the Mississippi, uh, down here in uh, coast, coastal Louisiana in the backdrop. Um, it was built as a delta plain by the Mississippi over the last 7,000 years ago. Essentially, the Mississippi uh, evolving and moving from building a delta in one location to building a delta in another location to another location to another location, gradually switching about every 1,000 years or so. It's the way big rivers work. It's a totally natural process as we understand it. And so um, what happened, this is just a map of uh, the order here, this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one, like this big muddy hose pipe kind of switching from one location to another across the coast over time. We'll see that again. And so over the 7,000 years, as, as sea level rose after the last glaciation to approximately its current location, sea level rise slowed down, the Mississippi could start building land. And, and this is the, uh, the coastline that we have now. And different parts of this coast are different ages. This is about three to 4,000 years old. This is about 2,000 years old. And uh, I don't think I have a dot on here, so I'll just tell you I live about there. This is the city of New Orleans up here. I live about there. And so the land that I live on is only about 2,000 years old. Uh, we have obviously quite good recorded history for many, many parts of the world. Uh, so we know what was going on in many places uh, really quite well, and the land that I live on wasn't even there. There are varying sediment uh, thicknesses too. We'll come back to that. The current situation is that the coast is in dire trouble. And we've lost uh, extensive areas of coastal land, marshes and barrier islands uh, to open water. Some statistics on here, uh, we'll see uh, uh, in the video, we'll show some pictures of this in a, that will make a whole lot more sense than just looking at, the, at this map. But what I want you to show is these colors here in pink and dark, dark uh, red here. Um, all of this area here in, uh, in yellow, the, this, this light blue, this is the water. Uh, the uh, yellow color here is land, and when we say land, that's marsh, not land like, you know, with rocks or, or till or anything like that. This is marshland here. And then the, the dark blue areas are the, are the highland where people live, uh, which have been cut out of this image. And so the, the pinks and the reds are either areas which uh, have been lost to open water or areas that we expect to lose. And some statistics down here, uh, the numbers uh, are dramatic. So what happened? in the Mississippi Delta between this natural thing over six or 7,000 years ago and what I just showed you, which was the 20th century and, and things not looking so good. Well, so let's look at this in cartoon form. Oops, wrong one, wrong way. So um, 
This is just a, a conceptual diagram of, of how that delta has developed. Um, a conceptual time along here with this being approximately a thousand years and some idea of land area here. And so what happens, the Mississippi River starts building a delta into open water. Uh, and so what happens is the river starts depositing land, land increases, right? And at some, po at some point, the Mississippi moves, avulsion occurs, and a delta, be delta building begins somewhere else, and the first delta uh, decays. But of course, as the, second, as the first delta decays, a new delta is being built in a different location. And so you see over time, as it switches from one location to another location to another location, uh, there's land loss and land gain going on at the same time. And this is a gradual process that we, as you'll see in the video, we think uh, built up the coast over five to 6,000 uh, years. What happened though in the 20th century was two things. We had much, much more rapid land loss that I sh showed you the statistics of on the previous slide, over 1,500 square miles between 1956 and 2000, I think, were the, were the numbers there. Very, very rapid land loss, but importantly here, limited land building. We essentially uh, uh, stopped this switching process and really managed the river such that it couldn't build land anymore. Let me show you this. This is... Um, a uh, historical map of the mouth of the Mississippi River about 1870. And, and one of the things I always like about this map is not that it's an historical map or anything like that. I like historical maps, but it's this caption up here, Delta of the Mississippi River before improvement. Obviously, somebody thought there was something wrong with this, right? That it had to be improved in some way. And this, of course, is the story of how we get from these natural cycles of land gain and land loss gradually over time building up a coast to the situation that we have uh, now. And so th there's a, a great story, which I, I won't go into in a lot of detail, of, of uh, an, a, an epic debate in the 19th century about how to manage the river in order to uh, keep the uh, mouth of the river open for navigation. Uh, the river was becoming a very important access into the, into the middle of the continent uh, for commerce. And so um, I can't remember what year this report is, 1876 or something like that. But Humphreys and Abbott had this great debate as to whether to put jetties on the mouth or whatever. And, and anyway, we ended up with jetties. And that thing that you just saw got improved. That was in the 19th century. In the 20th century, the great flood on the Mississippi of 1927 was, was clearly something of great import for the US. This was a, this was a, a major disaster and uh, there are excellent stories about how this uh, changed uh, various aspects of US policy. Um, uh, less than 300 people died, but thousands and thousands of people in, in the states of Mississippi and Arkansas were displaced as the river burst its banks um, and burst through the levees that were in existence before the 1927 flood. But after the 1927 flood, we got into the flood control business in a very, very uh, big way and really got very serious about it. This is a this is a pic. This is the, the state of Louisiana here. Here's New Orleans, uh, the mouth of the river that we just saw just now. This picture is uh, I got this from the Corps of Engineers. Um, the orange lines here are the levees that were built along the Mississippi River, these artificial embankments designed to hold the river in its channel and prevent that kind of flooding that we saw on the previous slide that had been so devastating in the 1927 flood. Um, the picture, and so this is what, this is the 1920s, no, excuse me, 1997 flood uh, when the river was high. And what you see is the water is confined within the levees here. This is just a depiction of what area of the coast would have flooded of the state, not just the coast, would have flooded if the levees had not been in place. So clearly we're quite good at this, right? We've actually prevented large areas of flooding really quite effectively. And as I live down here, this is probably quite a good idea, right? I, as far as I'm concerned. But it does have consequences. Other things that we've done to the river, we have um, we've really modified the tributaries upstream, particularly on the Missouri. Huge dams were built on the Missouri in the 1950s that dramatically uh, decreased the sediment load coming down the Missouri. Other changes in land practices may have increased the amount of sediment coming down the Ohio. Just uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these kinds of diagrams, um, the width of the of the tree, if you like, the limbs on the tree or the trunk on the tree, if you think of these, these things as a tree, the width is proportional to the amount of sediment in the river. 
And this is a, an estimate for about 1700. This was a, a result of a lot of studies that were done in the 1980s. And so you can see a dramatic change uh, in what was coming down the Missouri. Uh, still, though, importantly, there is lots of sediment in the river. There may not be as much as there used to would be, but there's still a lot of sediment uh, in the Mississippi River of the order of 120 million tons of sediment every year coming down uh, the Mississippi River. What happens to it? It goes straight into the Gulf of Mexico because of those levees. Remember that we built to stop me flooding and other people flooding because of those jetties that we put on the mouth of the river so that we could navigate uh, in and out of the river. Because of those things that we did to the river, all of that sediment that could be rebuilding coastal Louisiana is being lost into the Gulf of Mexico. And so what you see, and this is a, a modus image of, of coastal Louisiana, this is New Orleans, this is my house, you get in the geography now, the mouth of the river down here, uh, and the, 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 the light brown water here is the sediment in the river. It is bypassing the coastal wetlands, it is not building the coast. Um, obviously about a year ago, uh, many people were focused on what was going on around here, right? About here was the Macondo Well, head that blew up about, a, about a, a year ago. And so many of us know that the water depth there is about 5,000 feet, right? It was deep, a mile deep. Um, gets very deep very quickly out here. And so what's happening is we're trying to build land with 120 million tons of sediment a year in 300 feet of water. And we're not doing very, not doing very well. Uh, these deltas were built in here, the ones that originally built the coast in, you know, 10 to 15 uh, feet of water. So. Although we don't have as much sediment as we had before, we essentially, it's bypassing the coast. It's going straight on by. We did a few other things. We dredged a few navigation channels through the coast. I don't want to blame everything on, on what we did to the river, the 20th century. We altered the salinity balance in the estuary quite dramatically with some navigation channels that we built, these straight lines that go across the coast, uh, just cutting it up like this. We'll see some of this. Um, you know, when you look at it from a satellite view like this, it, it doesn't look too bad. But when you actually look at it close on the ground, there are pipeline canals out the Wazoo. Obviously, we have a, a very active oil and gas industry offshore, a network of pipelines that come in from offshore. Um, they have, many of them were built in the 1960s and 70s, and we used to just dredge up the wetlands and make a canal. And these scars across the landscape are very, very uh, common. Um, we did lots of things to the coast. We did lots of things to cause the wetlands to degrade. So the question is, what do we do about it? And I'm going to keep moving pretty fast. What do we do about it? Well, I think and I'm going to move to the movie uh, very soon because I think that tells the story of this really quite well. Uh, after Katrina um, in 2005, many of us were very concerned that you know, we really had to do something about the coast. We had the nation's attention. We had the world's attention, I think, for, for a short period of time there. And that we needed to get all the good ideas on the table, right? We wanted to know if there was something that we should be thinking about that we could do. And so we had the opportunity um, to bring a bunch of people, um, about 35 uh, folks uh, to New Orleans uh, and took them around uh, for a week. People from, well, yeah, people from the Netherlands, Venice, uh, the Nile Delta, Australia, um, San Francisco, um, I can't remember who, we had a bunch of people. Anyway, so we took them around and we showed them the coast and then we said, well, what should we do? What do you think? And, you know, they said, if, if you continue the way you're going, business as usual, then the future is bleak. That's what the report says. The future is bleak. The coast is going to continue to go to hell in a handbasket. All the sediment is going to go offshore like it does now. The sea level is going to gradually rise. Communities are going to haphazardly move. You know, you might as well get out of there while the going's good kind of thing. What they said also was, when this is probably the most important message, that there is a sustainable future for coastal Louisiana. To hit that too hard. There is a sustainable future for coastal Louisiana. And it takes bold action. You have to harness those resources that are in the Mississippi River to rebuild the coast. You have to get land building going again. And you'll see, and this is just a cartoon, you'll see, let me go back one, the, the delta that we've seen in many of these slides, abandon the Birdsfoot Delta. The Birdsfoot Delta that's in all of our textbooks, you know, that I learned about in high school, I don't know how many decades ago. It's an artifact of how we've managed the river at this point. Abandon that, 
think about using the river to rebuild the coast, get those processes uh, going again. And then there is likely a sustainable future for coastal Louisiana, smaller than it, than it is now, but there is the possibility that something uh, could be done. Essentially, the message is stop wasting uh, uh, that sediment. And so at this point, just to, um, I'm going to show you a little uh, movie here. Um, and I think we have sound, so just excuse me while I, I pull this off. And I went through that pretty quick. I'm not going to talk for too much longer after we finish the movie here. I think we have sound. This was done by the Cornell Ornithology Lab. So there's a lot of birds, but it's quite good, I think. If I pick up a handful of dirt in Mississippi, help it on the water. I'm looking at a mixture of the whole middle of America, from the Rocky Mountain Continental Divide all the way over the Appalachians and up to the Canadian border. One of the important things to understand about the Mississippi River Delta is it's made of the rest of the continent. Little grains of sand and mud and dirt come from fields in Iowa and Wisconsin and other places like that. And they get into the rivers. And they gradually make their way down the river into a bigger river, into a bigger river, into the Mississippi. And then eventually get transported down to the Gulf of Mexico. When the fast flowing river hits the Gulf of Mexico, that sediment just drops out. And that's what builds the delta. This is a dynamic process of ebb and flow, growth and decay, carrying on over time. Eventually, though, they balance out, and we manage to get the coast of Louisiana just emerging out of the Gulf of Mexico, made up of all these delta lobes. The Mississippi Delta is one of the richest wetland communities on planet Earth fed by a half a continent's worth of nutrients that are coming down the river and then spread out there across these different habitats. The total biomass, just the amount of living organism that, that is in there in the water is beyond imagination. You can see that because some of these breeding colonies of birds have thousands and thousands of breeding pairs. That huge community is telling us that the delta itself, the marsh systems out there, are teeming with life. What looks like just marsh to the untrained eye is actually then part of the separate ecosystems that interact and that support a tremendous amount of life. It's just a very rich, productive system that supports up to 40% of the nation's waterfowl during the winter and supports 40% or so of the nation's raptors, shorebirds, and waterfowl during migration. This really is a region of the United States that is unique <coughs> on the planet in its diversity, in its importance, both to the natural systems out there and to the humans that live in the region. Nature can be thought of as a factory. It produces goods that we use, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink. You can think of the Delta as this particularly valuable and productive factory. 30% or so of the seafood for the United States comes from these Mississippi River built marshes. You can think of the Mississippi system as a funnel through which a huge percentage of our national trade flows. Trade, of course, doesn't just flow down through the Delta. Our economy is dependent on products and inputs we're importing that flow up through the Delta. When you try to put an economic value on the Mississippi Delta, you get a number between 12 and 47 billion dollars a year. If we shut off the outlets that fueled settlement into the streams that nourished the wetland landscape. 2,300 square miles since the 1930s it has gone from continuous marsh, solid marsh, to open water. That is an area roughly the size of Delaware. With this 
and estimating the football field every 45 minutes. So we can tell you, we're going to lose 24 square miles this year. The reason why New Orleans was able to withstand hurricanes in the past was that we had 20, 30, 40 miles of continuous marsh, solid land between the city of New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. And that land would absorb a lot of the hurricane surge. You have to kind of do this balancing act between getting those natural processes that can build us land going in and providing the kind of flood protection and ability to navigate that, that we really need in this country. We're going to rely on the Mississippi River to be managed differently than it is today. Today it's managed primarily for flood control, navigation. We need to manage the Mississippi River as a total asset. Now we have to think about what we want the next 50 to 100 years to be like, and then think about how we can take actions that steer it in that direction. Not steer it back, steer it in a new direction, forward. That's the end of the movie. Uh, I'm going to go back to the slides, but I just want to let the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, get some credit there because uh, it's uh, their, uh, their video. Uh, and it, there is a, that's the, it's on YouTube. It's called Restoring America's Delta. And there's a 24 minute version, which is, which I, which is, I think, uh, better, goes into more detail. So the issue then for the Mississippi is, is we've got, we've got this, these great, this great resource for the United States. We've got this great Delta and we've got all these great things that we want to do with the Mississippi River. We want to navigate, we want to have cities, we want to have flood protection. And what's happened in the, in the 20th century is because of the things that we have done, then the ecosystem, the natural environment has essentially suffered as a result. And so the path forward here has to be a new approach to river management that really balances these things out. And this is really the challenge of coastal systems across the world in the 21st century is how to do this balancing act. We, it, we, we have done so many things as we've developed and settled and exploited these coastal systems. Then now we've learned our lessons, but have we learned them well enough that we're going to actually uh, do things differently? And of course, that's the challenge uh, that folks like me uh, work on uh, kind of every day. And, and, and just to reiterate that point, with coastal Louisiana down here, and I'm talking about coast today, but this point that what happens at the coast is intimately uh, connected, especially with a system the scale of this, and, and I think this is probably the same in terms of, of, the, of the Fraser uh, uh, Delta area here too. What's going on? What do we want to do with the Mississippi River? What about irrigation? What about climate change? As, as we need different kinds of water supply to grow crops across the basin, what are we going to be exporting from this system in the future? Are we still going to be using grain to make ethanol? I hope not. What are we going to be importing into this system in the future? What are the international markets going to be that we're going to serve? What kind of industries are there going to be in the 21st century that this river has to support? What kind of things do we have to get out? Who is going to need flood protection? Are we still going to be able to support these major coastal cities like New Orleans in the face of sea level rise and things like that? Who is going to need to be protected? Panama Canal facility coming online. What kind of ships are going to need to navigate in and out? What kinds of things are we going to be growing? What kind of, uh, uh, kinds of things are we going to be able to grow given water supply in the future? What are we going to do about nutrients coming down the river? I haven't said anything about that. That's another whole obviously big issue for the coastal ocean down there. Oil and gas industry is clearly huge and for the next few decades it's still going to be there. How does what we do on the coast interplay with our offshore and our onshore oil and gas industry? The issues of energy security which are primary it seems to in, in, in the, uh, in the, um, in the in, for the uh, US, uh, US people and, and really just, you know, the, the water that's in the river and how is that going to be used? And so when you're at the bottom of a system like this and you're trying to think about the future of the coastal system, then it's really very important to look upstream. And when you look upstream, there are really the, the, the number of issues that have to be uh, uh, addressed or considered anyway really a magnified. And so for scientists like us, what the challenge, the challenge for the decision makers, if you like, is the new way of managing the river and the coast for the 21st century. The challenge for us as scientists 
is really to provide constructs that can put all those kinds of things together in order to inform that decision. And so, and so for us, we really we talk about systems level analysis a lot of the time, but we have to think about the system, not just in terms of how the natural system works, but think about the social issues, the economics, and the engineering uh, at the same time. And that's really why I wanted to come back to this diagram, because it seems to me that, that what we face in Louisiana, but what we face in many, many of these coastal systems is this dynamic here and how we can get the balancing act of this social ecological system uh, down. And one of the other important, you know, what do, what do people at the coast really need to know? We've got national decision makers that we want to inform that are going to make decisions about the Mississippi River. But there are lots of local decisions made at coast that people need to know what's going to happen uh, in the 21st century. This is uh, Galveston and Houston up here. Yeah, these are the kinds of things that happen on the coast. We need to be able to tell people what not to do, where they shouldn't build, where they could build, uh, what they, kinds of things are not going to be viable. And many of them are obvious. People should be able to plan for the future. Not just, if you like, react to things. And this is an example of a community down here in coastal Louisiana that, as a result of a hurricane uh, in 1898, relocated further inland. They reacted to that hurricane and the whole community moved inland. We don't want that kind of thing to happen in the 21st century. We expect to be able to use our science and our knowledge and our understanding of the system and how it's going to change in the future to help people plan for things like that, not have to uh, react to events. And so, uh, and the town of West Wego is, is what that town is, uh, is now called. Um, the people are crucial uh, to these systems in terms of the importance and what they do to the systems, but how they, how um, uh, society across the coast uh, varies. This is some work from Susan Cutter's group at the University of South Carolina, where the, this again is the Gulf Coast of the US. This is Texas over here, the Mexican border. This is uh, the area we were looking at earlier, uh, Southern Florida. We were looking at the Everglades over here and here's coastal Louisiana uh, in the middle here. And what they've done here is that they've taken a, a coastal vulnerability index from the US Geological Survey. This is about how rapidly the coast is eroding and how many how many problems the, the coastal system has in terms of sea level rise and erosion. And you see here that on this uh, vulnerability index, uh, Louisiana comes out high. They've added on to that a social vulnerability index, which is about uh, the characteristics of the population, poverty levels, education levels, things like that. What elements of society are there that are vulnerable and how do they map across coastal parishes and counties? And then importantly, they've put those two together to recognize that there's a vulnerability for that population at a place, which is specifically associated both with the characteristics of the place and of the population. And so this is another way of looking at these coastal challenges and thinking about what we understand of the dynamics of the coast and how they're going to change in the future with climate, how it interacts with the people in there and why the people are there uh, to, pr to uh, provide a context for problems which really we are going to have to face up to. Because these are the people that are going to be flooded in the future when the next storm comes through. I want to just quickly uh, finish here with an example from the UK. You know, I talk a lot about the 21st century and how, you know, I, perhaps I haven't said it tonight, but the 21st century has to be different from the 19th and the 20th century. You know, people moving to the coast in dramatic numbers, exploiting coastal resources, causing all kinds of problems, we have to be able to think about those things better in the 21st century than we have in the 20th. And this is just an example of how some of that thinking has been done uh, in the UK for, for flood management and, and particularly for coastal flood management. And so one of the things that's important to think about, and this is in the context of these issues like like, like climate change and sea level rise and those kinds of things. For the UK government, what is it that they can actually control? What are the knobs that they can put their hand on and turn? And so this is just an example of, of, 
of the idea that there are some things that influence what goes on in terms of floods and, and coastal dynamics that we have no control over. And there are other things that we have that, that are actually the things that we can, we can get our arms around about flood defense and flood forecasting and, and a kind of gradation uh, uh, between the two. So that's a really important thing uh, for, for, to identify that up front. What is it that we can actually manage? And then the other thing that they've done is think about uh, the future, the 21st century, in terms of a number of scenarios, in, in many ways reflecting the kinds of scenario analysis which is done in the, in the IPCC uh, climate change assessment reports, but recognizing that there are these gradations, this is a classic kind of scenario space diagram, where there's a trend either towards consumerism or towards the value of community, interdependence on one axis towards autonomy. Which one of these quadrants, these four um, uh, these four uh, places on this diagram uh, might we be in the future? Uh, are we going to be um, uh, looking, at some, looking at a society that is dominated by consumerism and interdependence with world uh, global trade over here? Or are we going to be looking at, at something that values community much more and where uh, local systems are, are, are more dominant? And so they take this, um, these scenarios and apply it to... Um, coastal flood forecasting uh, across the UK. And so what you see then is you see different maps of uh, change in flood probability from 2002, this, in this case to 2080, the maps across the coast, where each one of these maps represents a different uh, quadrant uh, on this diagram. And so you can see, therefore, one of the things that you can get out of this kind of scenario analysis in terms of informing people, and I'm interested in the coast here, that there are a number of places here that you see. There are, these maps are different in character, as they should be, because they represent uh, different kinds of future conditions uh, that, that may be equally plausible. But what you see, if you look at the, the, uh, the scenarios in terms of the change, uh, medium and high, the darker color reds, is that there are some parts of the coast, particularly around the coast, where it's trouble no matter what happens. Okay, and this is the kind of analysis, just thinking about the future, uh, trying to think whatever, we don't have to worry at the coast about which one of these quadrants we're in, because whatever happens at the coast, we need to do something uh, about uh, flood forecasting. So I think this foresight exercise in the UK is something that I look at a lot in terms of helping people think about how they can manage coasts and plan for the future uh, in a lot better way than, than I think we have uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century. Um, for us, for me, in the university community, this has got to be the key. Taking the knowledge that we have, the example from, that I just showed you from uh, Susan Cutter's group with the Social Vulnerability Index, taking the social science, putting it together with the natural science, thinking about what that means for decision makers, thinking about how we use our engineering uh, to solve problems like that, thinking about how we understand the natural system dynamic. That's the challenge for us to try and put this together. I started with this diagram. I didn't really talk about it at the beginning, but this is a diagram from the, from the working group to chapter six of the uh, fourth assessment report. And for me, it kind of sums up the issue about climate change and coastal systems. Um, and it really represents the challenge. At the coast, we are looking at dramatic changes as a result of climate change. But importantly, it's not just the influence of climate change on the coast, it's the influence of climate change on the marine system and how it affects the coast. It's the influence of climate change on the upstream system and how it affects the coast. And then within the coastal system, we have this intriguing and very compelling, for me anyway, dynamic between the natural part of the system and the human part of the system and getting that balancing act right within this larger context. This is a huge challenge. And it's one I think that as scientists we need to be able to step up to because we know how important these coastal systems are and we know that the 20th, 20th century is not something that we want to repeat. Thank you. Sorry, a bit long. Yeah, yeah. No, I went through that pretty quick. The um, so the um, 
the coastal vulnerability index here is, is based on issues like uh, uh, relative sea level rise rate, coastal erosion rate, those kinds of things. And so uh, the places that are high here are places in Louisiana that we talked about, where the coast is falling apart. Uh, the upper Texas coast, which is um, uh, probably suffering from uh, shoreline erosion and storm damage and those kinds of things. And so there are places over here, so that's where, where you get high score over here. Uh, places that are doing okay over here are the, uh, the limestone uh, shores of, uh, of clear water and, uh, and the uh, opening. So, so this is the natural system dynamic, what's happening within the natural system. The social vulnerability index is dependent on who lives there. And so these divisions that you see on this are uh, counties. And so what you see here, uh, this, the, there's a lot of mediums in here. Let's look at the lows. The low areas here are, are relatively wealthy areas uh, where there's high education levels, uh, high income levels, uh, low poverty rates, um, uh, higher social vulnerability down here in uh, uh, where there's a, um, a greater um, um, uh, uh, it's, uh, poverty, education, things like um, Oh, um, non-native speakers. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm losing the the word for uh, for people who don't people who don't speak English uh, uh, as their first language. Uh, down here in um, in uh, parts of Florida, southern Texas, agricultural workers, those kinds of things. And so these people are are, are vulnerable in the sense of not being uh, resilient to stress. Things happen that you know they can't deal with uh, changes in employment, uh, economic cycles, those kinds of things. They're, they're societally vulnerable, independent of anything that happens in the natural environment. And so that when you put those two together, particularly when you're on the Gulf Coast here and you think about hurricanes, you think about Katrina, if you like. I mean, when you have an event like that that happens in a, in a, in a neighborhood that uh, has savings in the bank and the ability to come back and has house insurance and those kinds of things, then the response of that, of that community is very different than if they have a higher social vulnerability. And so what this one at the bottom down here does is essentially it puts the two together and recognizes the area where the coastal system, the physical aspects of the system are, um, are under stress and, and likely to be threatened by things like storms or floods or those kinds of things and where the population is not gonna be able to uh, take that. And so this, these are the areas where we should be focusing on helping people plan, getting them out of harm's way, focusing on evacuation, focusing on elevating houses, or just you know, providing better opportunities for them in order to uh, increase their, their, um, their social resilience, uh, if you like. So, that's how the, so, it, so this is a, a purely a, a societal, this is a purely natural environment, but it's when you overlay the two together that, that from, a, from, a, from a government standpoint, this is where your real problem areas are. It's fascinating stuff. She's done this for, um, I think this paper, it's in, um, it's in Journal of Coastal Research, has these maps for uh, the three coasts of the US, the Atlantic and the Pacific too. There may well be work on this in Canada too that I'm not familiar with. Thanks. Um, I'm Jean Simon. I'm a master's student here in the remote sensing lab. Okay. Uh, first, thank you, Denise, for your wonderful talk. I think it was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I just, I know we talk about lots of different uh, challenges with uh, the coast, uh, with the sediments and uh, uh, the sea level rising mm -hmm. and uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. I just want to know if you have any thoughts about uh, what happened with the BP uh, oil spill. Yeah. And, you know, it's been a year already. And, yeah. and what has been done with the coast? Is it, is it enough? Or yeah, no, it's, it was very interesting to be here this week and not there. Um, let me find a picture of coastal Louisiana. I, I always have to have a picture to talk to, but let me uh, see if I can describe to you. Let's use this one. Um, so the, the, uh, what happened, um, obviously you all know what happened with the spell, right? It was about here. I think my battery's running low. And, and one of the good things, uh, we, we were really, as far as the coast is concerned in Louisiana, we were very lucky. Uh, obviously, there was a huge amount of oil in the system. Um, um, uh, luck, I guess, is characterized in, in, a, in a number of ways. Uh, to begin with, the winds uh, were not bringing it directly on shore. For the first month or so, the winds in the Gulf of Mexico were really trying to, were keeping it out. We had a couple of late fronts with 
pushing north winds through, uh, uh, keeping it offshore. The other thing is the Mississippi River was very high last year, very, for, for a long period of time. It was high early. It was high even in November uh, 2009 and stayed pretty high all the way through June. And so that meant, uh, this, is not a, this is not a 2010 picture, this is a 2008 picture probably. But what that means is you have this kind of push of water out of here at the surface. And obviously a lot of the water was floating on the surface once it got to the top. And so that actually stopped a lot of oil coming in uh, this way. The other thing that the state did, there, is a, there are a few places up here where, um, where we have the ability structurally to get a little bit of water out of the river into the marshes to kind of nourish them. And they opened all of those to get as much of a push out as we could with the fresh water to try and um, keep it out. Um, there were a few, and obviously you saw the pictures probably in the, in the media of, of people booming and, and skimming and those kinds of things. There's a, a place down here that got a bit of oil and there's a place in here that got a bit of oil. Um, and a lot of oil. I mean, I mean, the size of this building that maybe that had um, uh, uh, an amount of oil on. But given the complexity of the coast that you saw in the, in the, in the movie there, you know, these wetlands are, are very complex. Um, the, only a few small areas were really oiled in, in, in any great way. And the other thing that happened was we have a lot of these marsh islands. I think you saw those as the, as, the, as the coast deteriorates. We get water and land and this kind of complex pattern. And the, the oil was obviously floating on the water. Well, for the most part, I would say obviously floating on the water. As it moved into the coast, most of it was floating uh, on the water. Uh, and... Um, the marsh grass actually did a really good job of kind of catching it at the edge. And so what you have a lot of the time is, a, is an island of marsh, say the size of this building, and it has a, like a bathtub rim of oil around the edge of, say, two meters wide of oil around the edge, but the oil just never got into the middle. The tide in Louisiana, this is probably something I should have mentioned, tidal range in Louisiana is only about a foot, two feet, you know, half a meter uh, it's almost as big as it gets. And so what that means is that at high tide, even at high tide, this grass still sticks out the water. And so that means if there's oil floating in, the grass is going to catch it. And, and it did a good job. So um, we have um, thousands and thousands of miles of shoreline in this very complex kind of pattern. And um, there was a story in the New York Times, I guess, on uh, Monday or Tuesday that said, dozens of miles had been oiled. And so we were really very lucky, really. Um, I fly the coast a lot because it's the best way of seeing it, as you can tell from the video, right? It's much easier to see from the air. And, you know, we fly people down here all the time. And if, you know, you have to look for the oil. You have to really know where to go to find the oil. So there are a few places that are really bad, a place called Bay Jimmy, which is getting a lot of press this week. But really, we were very lucky. Um, it could have been a whole lot worse. And I think many of us were very worried this, this, well, not this, you know, two weeks from now, beginning of May, we were really worried, but it really wasn't, wasn't as bad as it could be. So the news is, is raising enthusiasm in this uh, province for encouraging more tankers to move across the West Coast for uh, purposes of developing the resources of uh, British Columbia. A lot of these coasts still didn't have a bedrock. So what would be your advice to the, uh, to the uh, companies that are encouraging this? Uh, so it doesn't look as if the Gulf example has had much uh, effect in this part of the world in dampening the enthusiasm for uh, more movement of oil yeah. through the waters. Well, oil's what, 110 US dollars a barrel this week or something. You know, that's, that's what drives a lot of that, of course. Um, but um, when, when, the, when the oil spill happened last year, there was a lot of thought about Exxon Valdez. And, and I don't know how many times you know, I talked to people in the newspaper saying, you can't steam clean a marsh. Remember those images from Valdez of people steam cleaning boulders? You can't, do, don't do that. <laughs> don't even think about doing that in the marsh. That's not gonna work. Uh, keep the people out of the marsh was our big message because they'll do more harm than good if they, if they get in there and try and clean it up. Um, 
maybe there are more lessons from, from that than, than there are from, from this in terms of actual kind of cleanup and preventive techniques and what you could expect uh, to happen. But I think that perhaps one thing that has happened down here, um, and, and transport of oil in tankers is different from production and exploration in the sense you have a fixed amount, but it could be a fixed amount in any, in any uh, one, um, you know, the tank is very mobile, is that the industry in the Gulf of Mexico, um, partly in response to the increased regulatory and, 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 and uh, clamp down on permits, has really got, its, so it got much more organized on response. Uh, than they were before. And I think one of the lessons that, that the, uh, the one year later comes from most of the, be it the, the Coast Guard or the industry is that they just really weren't that well prepared. And um, just being prepared, having equipment um, is there, is, is almost the, the, the best protection that you can have. Or just not do it. What's the trade off of not doing it? Well, that's the polarization well, that's that, it. that exists. In yeah. Well, okay, but well, I mean, that's uh, you know, at the, the, uh, uh, Professor Slaymaker and I went to um, uh, uh, Dr. Sen's uh, lecture this afternoon, and the idea of reasoning, you know, uh, that you know, that think about the pros and the cons on both sides of this, and and try to find something. Uh, does it have to be this or that, or is there something in the middle? Um, and and you know, the the idea of we're not going to move 8 million people out of Florida, right? They're going to be there. Um, you, you know, the idea with, the, with coastal systems of, I can't, can't just say, take navigation out of the Mississippi River, remove the levees, right? You just, you know, those are, those are not, that's not a tenable position to have in the dialogue. That doesn't get you anywhere saying, you know, we've got to put the river back to nature. You know, that just, that doesn't, that doesn't work. So there's, you know, trying to move towards some kind of, um, solution or compromise other or, or people maybe people in Canada are just prepared to pay more for fuel if it comes another way that's that's a, that's an extremely difficult argument in the US but that might work in Canada of course <laughs> They're not a relatively wealthy society with high technology behind it. That, that both generates the predisposition to develop and it also supplies capabilities to cope. Yes. Why in comparison with the prognosis for a rapidly developing coast, I think the Chinese developers, for example, are they going to have to go through the same experience to deny the certain license? And what about the prognosis for coastlines and very poor societies such as in Bangladesh? Excellent question. Excellent question. I I would I think that um, there are some interesting discussions in the Mekong. I think at, at the moment, which may may be an example of that. And you, and you know you know they just the, the debate over the dam in in Laos and. Um, you know, the delay of that decision is, is you know, perhaps a, perhaps a development. One of the things about, about many of these large delta systems in, um, I made the point at the beginning that they've been the, the central to civilization for some time, but many of them have been um, developed over thousands of years such that the natural environment is, has almost been eliminated. There is very, one of the things about this system is for a, for a world-class delta, it still has a large amount of natural environment. Not pristine environment, but natural environment. It's still marshes, it's not agricultural fields, it's not rice paddies. And, and so uh, I, I think that many of these systems, um, perhaps in China, are, we've, we've made decisions that may be irreversible as far as the natural environment is concerned in many of these. I think that the Mekong, perhaps, um, is, uh, is a place where, um, where you know, there's increasing pressure from agriculture uh, sh um, uh, to uh, cut down forests, uh, make, uh, harness the fresh water flows that the river provides uh, to support aquaculture. Um, and uh, that you know, can have severe problems. One of the, one of the things that, that um, there has been some analysis on, particularly for mangrove-dominated systems, 
is to really look at the economics of this. And again, this idea of bringing in different kinds of, uh, kinds of disciplines to it. Uh, we've done some work, we're looking at the, the economics of, of uh, converting a mangrove forest uh, to a shrimp pond versus, shrimp ponds, excuse me, versus keeping it as a mangrove forest and having uh, firewood production from it and uh, its role as wave attenuation and other kinds of things that you get from this. And, and the idea of, when you look at the economics of this, um, of the, in terms of the, the, the goods and services that can be provided by keeping the system natural, the economics of this show that uh, there's a lot to be gained by keeping it in a natural state. And so um, one of the issues here is we're trying to, we've got nature and it's, it's on its last legs and we're trying to get it into better shape. One of the stories for places like that is perhaps to try and help them not do the things that we did to begin with and so pro to provide support in order to, to realize the values that the natural system um, provides to them at the moment. But the provision of food in places like that and the ability to, uh, to, um, to uh, get short-term gain from um, converting a mangrove forest to a shrimp pond is clearly something that's very attractive to the local community. We've obviously got protections on the, um, uh, what's it called in the uh, Brahmaputra, the Sundarban. The, you know, obviously we've got some international protections on some areas too. Uh, um, and if, if they can hold up, then, then in some areas that can provide uh, that can provide protection. But these are real challenges, and these are challenges perhaps for the, for the developed world to assist with. Yeah. One of the problems that I see in all this is that the, the benefits of maintaining the natural aspects of the natural system and receiving certainly one of the services mm -hmm. generally a benefit to the whole society. Everybody benefits and therefore nobody particularly benefits. Whereas the benefits of particular developments, conditions of development, are usually flow to well-defined smaller groups that mm -hmm. will put the default influence. Mm -hmm. So the essential issue of refining is in the end the social development. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I, I don't disagree I don't disagree with that at all. And the the uh, um, the kind of buzzword, I guess, for those kinds of considerations is um, integrated coastal zone management. Is you know the is the phrase that that uh, is is used, and that there are a number of efforts towards that in in many uh, developing countries to try to integrate uh, sustainable fisheries practice, particularly. Uh, into consideration of, of coastal management and coastal development, the idea that the idea that the uh, keeping the system as a mangrove forest provides more sustainable fisheries with better water quality for a long time, conversion of mangrove forests to shrimp ponds is usually a short-term yield. Um, you know, problems with water quality, you know, ten years in that then provide downstream effects. And so, um, you know, there are some quite good, I think, examples of of uh, integrated coastal zone management, but the pressures are, are strong in the other direction, undoubtedly. You know, what I just think is that four years ago, we went to the same board and was quite very crazy about it. Yeah. We don't hear much about that anymore. We are? And, and why, why is that? Is that because we, uh, I I think we, we learned? learned? I think we learned. It was a very politically, very, very difficult thing to do. Uh-huh. And it's the same. And there are, there are aspects of, of that work through the rules and regulations of various environmental water resource agencies and standards and facilities in the mm -hmm. But the, the issue is that there's an uncertainty of the electric solution of dissipating the environment or all that close attention to those aspects of the land and the land. Not the usual, you know. That I think you're right. I think you're right in general. There, there is actually a counter trend at the moment in terms of the ecosystem management, which is quite a, a prominent uh, thing in British Columbia, um, and uh, the whole kind of uh, using the ecosystem as a basis for management rather than the drainage basin seems to be quite a growing thing. But you're right. The actual drainage basin management.
It, actually, in a drainage, ba a drainage basin issue, I mean, obviously I don't do uh, drainage basins, you know, every day, but what, what's happening in, in water resources in the U.S. is really that we've built out, you know, a huge infrastructure, which we now can't afford to maintain. And we, we now have, you know, locks and dams across the country that are 50, 60 years old, that are where the infrastructure is deteriorating, it's not working right. The, the, the one thing that Katrina did was, was uh, result in a huge review of levee safety and dam safety. And we now recognize that we've got billions and billions of dollars of, of legacy infrastructure issues to deal with. And so the idea of asset management of those things and decommissioning and how can we, how can we really, how can we afford to support this, I think is, is a very real issue. It's, it's something that, you know, is very much tied up in, in DC budget issues at the minute. But we can't actually get coal from Pittsburgh, which is where it you know, cut down the Mississippi and out the mouth because there are locks and dams on the upper Ohio, which are just, you know, falling in the water, essentially. Well, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate you bringing coasts to our attention. But uh, also for the first time in the series, we've had a uh, rather direct discussion of social, ecologi social ecological systems. And uh, there's, uh, there's questions on different aspects of vulnerability. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it.